uh, Mr. Vela Atvani today. Uh, good morning, Vela. Morning. Good morning. Good, good morning. And uh, before we start having our conversation, I would like to ask you uh, to uh, uh, introduce yourself to us. Who is Bela Hadvani? Uh, well, I'm a grandfather and uh, a father of six children. I've been married to my wife for about 54 years. And uh, I'm uh, an entrepreneur and a philanthropist. Uh, I started working in industry for about nine years, and I found that it was a, for me, it was a penal institution. Uh, everyone said, uh, thank God it's Friday, and isn't it terrible, it's Monday. Anyway, so I resolved to start my own business and do things better. <laughs> uh, I built a company in Mexico that served the sugar industry with computer services. Uh, and then I, I moved to the States. I'd already been in the States for study. Uh, I moved back to the States and I uh, started a library automation business in, in 1971. Uh, that uh, went through its teething difficulties and then became a very successful company founded the online public access catalog industry uh, anyway, in the early 80s. Uh, I sold that to Thyssen Borna Mitzvah and kept a part which was uh, uh, electronic publishing, the first electronic publisher on CD-ROM. Okay. And uh, we we served about 1,500 large resource libraries throughout the world with uh, academic, academic reference information. And then we started moving out on the internet. And we ended up uh, selling that business to Walter Kluwer uh, and for various reasons in, in the early 2000s, after mm -hmm. about 20 years. Okay. And then I, I, I helped uh, two uh, women who were the founders of Just Giving. Uh, by that time, I basically wanted to create organizations that served all the constituents in a balanced way. Just, just, just Giving is, uh, for the people who don't know, is, is a crowdfund, crowdfunding platform, right? Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, giving company it was initially focused on giving money to charity and that was its main business and then it went into crowdfunding especially for local community and local purposes to help each other and the community mm -hmm. and it's uh, I think now getting about 40 or 50 thousand gifts a day of about 35 pounds on average uh, it's been taken over by a large American company called Blackboard, and I'm kind of focusing on uh, moving us from our growth economy uh, into a care economy, an economy that looks after the earth and all the beings on it. Yeah. But okay. An insane quest for growth, which has turned people into a kind of cancer on the planet Earth. Uh, which we're doing our best to destroy as rapidly as possible. So that's it in a nutshell. Okay, in a nutshell. <laughs> well, it sounds a lot to me. And um, I know that you currently are uh, developing uh, an inquiry to what you call coming from uh, the, the growth economy to uh, a care economy. Yeah. And, and especially... Uh, you have this wonderful uh, thought in your head you need to express about money. Could you tell us a bit more about uh, your feelings about money? Yes, well, I noticed that uh, the world is really designed 
to create abundance or at least sufficiency. Uh, mm -hmm. That the energy, the sun puts more energy on the earth in one hour than humankind consumes in a year. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, if we keep the soil living as it is in its natural state, every handful of soil contains uh, billions of little microorganisms. And if we use the soil correctly, it's super abundant and at the same time it's enriching itself. Uh, however, about 10,000 years ago, we started to destroy the soil, soil with plowing and stuff. Anyway, so we have created a society in which a high percentage of us uh, either experience scarcity or are one disaster away from scarcity and in which we have to actually sell our time, make slaves of ourselves in order to earn the money to stay alive. Okay. Uh, and this might have been useful uh, two or three hundred years ago. I'm not sure it was, but it might have been. Anyway, that's where we are. And at the moment, it's uh, driving us to this insane obsession with uh, growing more and more possessions and at the same time destroying our habitat. Mm -hmm. That's done mainly by the, the money system that we have which was invented ba way back uh, in the time of George II. And it's basically uh, a system in which when money is created, it's created as debt. Uh, it bears interest, it therefore requires growth, and it forces us into a kind of unsustainable practice. So I think one of the important things we have to do is change the money system. Uh, and another equally important thing is we have to learn how to treat the earth properly and do the right kind of farming. And that is already occurring in many places around the world. Mm -hmm. Spread as rapidly as possible. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Bela, um, Karen McCarthy, Jana Walterbeek, uh, Angelique Robin. Barbara Koos Kruid from the Netherlands are saying hello to us all. So, uh, oh, lovely. <laughs> lovely, lovely hello. you're all here. <laughs> yeah, great. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, okay, so I understand what you're, what you're uh, trying to explain here. Uh, this week I saw a warning coming from the IMF that our, our worldwide uh, debt as we currently know it, is about uh, over two times uh, our gross national product worldwide. And uh, IMF is warning that we can't go on like this. So you're, you're not the only one who is noticing this one. Um, yeah. what, what are your ideas uh, on how to, to solve the, the endless cycle of, of debt? How should, we, how should we treat money? Well, at the moment, as I said, uh, when money is created, at the same time, debt is created. You know, uh, when the, the monies we have are what, what are called fiat currencies. That means they are brought into being by declaration. God said, let there be light, fiat lux, uh, fiat money. And, uh, the European Union Federal Reserve Bank says, let there be money, and there is money. Mm -hmm. And uh, But when it's created, it's actually immediately lent uh, to the, the central bank, to the, and then out to the distributing banks, out to the retail banks, and out to us. And at each lending, the debt level increases. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, when we create money, we're at the same time creating debt. This means that next year we have to create more money to pay the money we created originally plus the debt to pay it back. Yeah. Uh, plus interest, I mean. 
Uh, and so that has been compounding now for centuries. So we're not guilty of creating deficits, except mm -hmm. that we designed money that automatically creates debt. But yeah. the, even the IMF, I don't, most of the people in that don't fully understand that this is the case. That's why we are so in debt. Uh, and it's presented to us as though we're guilty of not doing enough and we're getting into debt. Now, this mm -hmm. is an absolute nonsense. The fundamental mm -hmm. design of money must be changed so that money is not interest bearing. Uh, because okay. Bearing money forces growth and mm. that forces us to be a cancer on the planet. Um, so we basically need to redesign our money system. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, Karen uh, make, make her, makes a remark. Uh, she says, uh, I love the idea of the caring economy. I think people don't believe it's possible, though. Uh, are there small steps uh, we can take, you know, you and me, we can take towards uh, it to show uh, to others that it, you know, we can actually make a change out there? Uh, yes, Karen, I, I think there are. I think these steps are already going on all over the place. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of sharing activities uh, blossoming now, thanks to the internet, thanks to peer-to-peer -peer lending and peer-to-peer -peer giving of services like Uber and um, mm -hmm. Airbnb and, and uh, hundreds of others. Mm -hmm. and these are a form of, of caring. Uh, so. It's, this is an idea whose time has come. There are hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who are uh, promoting and encouraging caring activities. Um, and my purpose is really to somehow engage us all together in an inquiry so, so as to create a united front. Uh, and change this, the old system. Okay. At the same okay. time, Karen, it's very important to note that the nature of money itself has changed radically in the last 10 or 20 years. You know, I remember a few decades ago, I used to see uh, quite often an armored van going through the streets with, with payroll or mm -hmm. bullion of some kind. Mm -hmm. And money was kind of heavy stuff, gold and coins and, and paper notes that had to be carted around the place with armed guards. However, now money is already uh, digital. Uh, mm -hmm. the, money, the bank does not have a pile of coins in the vault uh, to cover your account it actually just maintains a ledger uh, which uh, records every transaction in and out of your account and maintains balance and that is the money that you have similarly me if i send you money uh, the bank enters something saying so much money from Bela to karen and karen mm -hmm. gets money uh, in mm -hmm. her and that ledger is similarly altered so mm -hmm. the money is really uh, held in ledgers which are digitally maintained uh, using very archaic uh, legacy kind of technology inherited from the 70s. Mm -hmm. because which, is, which is also very centralized. Yeah, it's designed to maintain central control. The money system is designed uh, rather like a system of rivers. I say rivers and canals, which flows out from the central bank through the distributing banks, through the retail banks to us. Mm -hmm. And we have, uh, there are people near this system of rivers and canals tend to have enough or, or more than enough money. The people far away have very little uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, insufficiency. Mm -hmm. And so it's now quite simple, now that money is digital, to actually change it 
into a system that is more similar to rain. Because uh, when money is created, it's done by what is now called quantitative easing. That is when the fiat bank says, let there be money. That's quantitative easing. The money suddenly appears. But at that instance now, all we have to do, instead of sending it through the old system, no. we need to, at that same instance, send half of it to the government for all important projects that the government has to do to keep our roads and our schools and our universities and our care centers and hospitals and all those things running. And the other half needs to go every week into every person's account uh, kind of 200 euros, 200 dollars, 200 pounds a week into every person's account, uh, which is enough for them to make, uh, stay in life, to have a, a lodging and food and fundamental things that keep, keep us alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is money like rain. Okay, and, 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 and uh, I'm getting a question on uh, quant quantitative reasoning. Uh, Jana is asking uh, quantitative reading, the, the current one, is just a, it's just a matter of printing money and, and giving birth to new debt, isn't it? Yes, it is. It, 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 at the same, yes, it is still in that same debt-centered system. Uh, but what I'm just describing is a, a different way of distributing it, instead of through rivers and canals, distributed mm -hmm. like rain into everyone's account. That's mm -hmm. what I call QE2, quantitative easing two. Okay. Now at the same time, the nature of money really needs to be changed because this system is so much, will be so much more uh, efficient than the old system, so much less costly. It doesn't have to be debt bearing anymore. And also, it doesn't have to be owned by anyone because at the same time, we recently developed a new technology called the blockchain. Now, all the blockchain is, is it's an absolutely trustworthy, absolutely unhackable ledger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the banks are really meant mm -hmm. to keep a trustworthy, unhackable ledger. But we know that the banks uh, have become corrupted by law uh, because the underlying system doesn't work anymore. Because mm -hmm. the world is soaked in debt, the banks could learn, no longer make their money by charging more interest than they had to pay. So uh, the banking system was allowed to merge investment bankers with retail bankers, with distributing bankers. And that allowed then the, our bank to invest our money speculatively. This was a way to enable the retail banks to make more money, mm -hmm. but it's essentially corrupted the system totally. And, uh, yeah, and, and a very complex system as well. You know, the big river and all the the, the sites, the small rivers. It, it's an endless. <laughs> yeah, exactly, women. It can be, it can be totally replaced by a really simple blockchain-based system, which yeah. distributes money at the time of creation, in roughly the proportions that I described. That, that has the further advantage that the government no, no longer needs to claw back from each individual 50% of the money that has been, that they've got in the form yeah. of because they get the money that they need for all those communities. Okay. Right so, so, when it's created. So uh, uh, if I understand you correctly, a side effect of this system you are promoting um, like just let money rain on one side, the, the governmental institutions, on the other side, the individuals. That also eliminates any need to have a tax system. Yeah, although we might still have certain kinds of taxes, for example, in very crowded city areas where 
uh, accommodation is at a premium, the local authority might decide to put some kind of excess property tax on mm -hmm. to just encourage a more even distribution of property. Mm -hmm. But that would be entirely different. And instead, um, um, we wouldn't have to struggle each year with this horrible business of paying our taxes that would just happen. Yeah. But there might well, be one local taxes uh, along the lines I just suggested. Okay. Well, I think that that might give you a couple of fans extra by this statement, Bela. A couple of what? <laughs> a couple, a couple of fans. Yes. <laughs> less taxes. Yeah, that would make life much simpler. Uh, less work for everyone. Uh, okay. We have been socialized in this idea that we have to work for our living, and that. Our work gives us meaning, and that if we don't have to work, we won't have meaning. All sorts of nonsense has, yeah. been, has been created. Yeah. In fact, why should we all be wage slaves? We don't mm -hmm. have to. Mm -hmm. We can do what our heart tells us to do. Yeah, which brings me to an interesting point because Karen uh, made a remark on this one and it was on the, on the top of my mind as well. Yeah, I think it, the, the stress people get you know, from not having sufficient money to, to cover their basic needs, uh, I think it's also, uh, it, it blocks you from, I think, uh, a lot of personal development and it also blocks you to actually start making a change out there which you are really passionate about because you just can't. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now there, there have been, uh, you know, because well, there have been surveys that have been done which ask two questions of tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. The first question is, if we had this uh, unconditional universal basic income, uh, would you as an individual continue to work? Mm -hmm. uh, the answer was 60% uh, said I'd work just as much. 30% said I'd work but a little less because I need to spend more time with the children or I'm going to take this course or something. And only 10% said they'd stop working. But the second question was asked to uh, everyone and said, would other people work? And 90% of that same group of people said that would be the problem. Other people wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that 90% of everyone a survey said that they would continue to work. And the same, and a different 90% of that same sample said the trouble is that other people wouldn't work. So the fact mm -hmm. is that 90% of people would just continue to work at, uh, 30% were less, but uh, and only 10% would stop, and they would stop for good reasons, for their education, for having a baby, for looking after the family or a sick yeah. friend. Yeah, well, that brings me to the next point. I, I also think that you know, when you talk about uh, universal basic income, I know there are some, some tests going on. I, I know there are tests going on in Scandinavia, in the Netherlands, by the way, as well. Uh, I also think it enables people um, to get the stress out of their life, and on the same moment, uh, it opens. I think it all it really opens uh, doors um, to actually be a little bit more caring about each other mm -hmm. because you have the opportunity yeah. to do so. Yes, you see, humankind is naturally an empathic creature mm -hmm. actually have mirror neurons in it we have endorphins we have oxytocin all sorts of things that um, cause us to be empathic individuals but for many thousands of years we have been nurtured brought up in a hierarchical society the way back when uh, they were living in small communities 
and they became agricultural and they started to domesticate animals and they treated animals abominably. Mm. And then, as that was warriors from the north, from this uh, this uh, uh, friendly climates, came down and uh, uh, dominated these agricultural communities. And they said to themselves, well, they can treat their animals like, well, we can treat them like they treat their animals. Okay. So we, we created a kind of hierarchical society. Yeah. Few had an awful lot, and uh, most had very little. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we're still in. But now we have had the internet for many years. We have open source. We can actually return all sorts of essential things to the commons. Essential thing being information. We must maintain the internet as the commons. Uh, this is terribly important. The blockchain must be maintained as the commons. Uh, mm -hmm. it's a, so it, uh, that means that it's owned by no one or by everyone, but not by someone. Mm -hmm. I understand. And I, I, the blockchain uh, technology, I think, is uh, crucial in the in this story. Yeah, yeah. Well, blockchain uh, will will be a, uh, an open source or owned by everyone, mm -hmm. not by one, uh, not by someone, um, mm -hmm. and unless we uh, allow something horrendous to happen and it actually falls into the hands of uh, through through law mm -hmm. into the hands of individuals mm -hmm. uh, but i you know it's just it is in fact a distributed ownership it's a system where the ledger is copied everywhere in the cloud mm -hmm. and it's not it's not somewhere so it's naturally something that's owned by everyone mm -hmm. and it, as i said it's totally uncorruptible and it can contain information uh, which is not only the value of what we own in money but also the value of what we own in land, the cars we own, uh, the, the identity that I own, you know, that I am me, <laughs> Bela Hathorne, you are him, um, mm -hmm. Wim Kiesenberg, uh, yeah. you know, even that could be stolen in the in the current institutions, and is sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's going to revolutionise, and is already beginning to revolutionise all our supply chains, uh, all sorts of things. So it's very. This is the time uh, to make this change, and for that to occur in the right way, everyone needs to be conscious. So I want to engage. You know, I don't have the intelligence to know how to create system that we're talking okay. about. But I know that there is the intelligence out there. And so I really want to engage you, the audience, and everyone else uh, in an inquiry which has a super, super intelligence to arrange for this kind of new system to occur and stop some corruption uh, to occur. Okay. Well, that, uh, thank you for the invitation. I know there are a lot of people out there that, uh, that actually would love to contribute to this uh, story. And we are going to do that in a, in a later stadium, stadium even locally here in Nice, and I hope in many places in the world. Um, uh, you, touched, you, you said something about uh, blockchain. You said something about uh, a growth economy. I, I read a, an article uh, a week ago where uh, my old uh, employer, IBM, uh, was giving uh, uh, their, their yearly uh, conference in uh, Las Vegas. They do, they do that every year. And yeah. there were two Dutch companies there, um, the, the, the harbor of uh, Rotterdam and the management of the, the airport uh, Schiphol in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And they made a statement that they're uh, teaming up with IBM um, to investigate um, the following. They want to become the smartest harbor and the smartest uh, airport in the world. And they're actually leaving behind their old school growth-based strategy. 
So there you go. Uh, I even see large companies um, making, an, a, a, I think, an historic change in, in terms of long-term vision because they understand that they can't sustain themselves by just keep on just, just growth. Yeah, there, yeah. there comes an end to the growth. Uh, and so now really finding their strategy to become uh, smarter in it, more efficient, more uh, sustainable, uh, better for the planet, better for all, all stakeholders in, 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 uh, involved. Which is actually very close to what you are uh, preaching, uh, Carrie. Yeah, well, in fact, transportation will become uh, a kind of the commons. Uh, that everyone will own a bit of it. There will all be standard sized packages, become a, a hundred times more efficient because everyone will be working together to make sure that every truck, every boat, every aeroplane uh, is always full when it takes off, nothing is wasted. Um, and this requires the kind of collaboration you just described that IBM is fostering. Mm -hmm. That's Schiphol and, uh, and the port of and the harbor. Yeah, yeah. Collaborating with, and this will spread throughout the world. And it's what Jeremy Rifkin talks about in his book of the empathetic uh, civilization. Mm -hmm. That we, we will, uh, that uh, logistics will also become commonly owned. Uh, transportation, he has three things I don't quite remember, but then mm -hmm. there's knowledge, transportation, and something else. Mm -hmm. It's worth his book. And another yeah. really worth looking at is uh, what Leanne Eisler is saying, because she's pointing out, um, among many other things, the importance of a kind of moving from uh, a kind of male-dominated hierarchical society to mm -hmm. a society between men and women. And she talks about that really beautifully in her book, The Chalice and the Blade. I recommend to everyone. Okay, I will. I will try. Uh, I will try to share the the, the URL uh, to uh, Rihanna Eisler uh, after this call. Yeah, yeah there are a lot of other uh, complementary aspects of what we're talking about that come into view as we engage further in the inquiry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we're not, we're not alone out there, Bella. We are not alone. No, no, no. We're, we're not alone. And for me, it's really like a, a sign of the times when I see real large companies that have a, a lot of uh, interest and, and uh, impact in a, in a country like the Netherlands actually making a, a strategic change, which will not happen overnight because it's a long-term process. Yeah. Uh, but I have actually never ever heard uh, uh, companies like that making statements like this, that they are actually transforming from a, a growth-based path to, to a smarter path, whatever that is. So we need to redefine what that exactly is. Yeah, well, IBM has been a, a leading star all of my life. You know, it, 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 it made a wrong move once with mini computers and kind of lost out to digital. But yeah. it, ran, it turned this ginormous company into uh, a whole new company based on the microcomputers and came back. Then it morphed into services, and now it's morphing again. It has this extraordinary agility, and its values, its shared values, are, are to do with service uh, of the, the the customers, employees, etc. It, it's yeah. uh, it's a wonderful uh, leading light. It's amazingly durable. There mm -hmm. are other companies like that, like Tata in India and uh, plenty more. Yeah, okay. And uh, I think we have a, all have a challenge here uh, when you talk about uh, going back to your favorite topic, money. Um, I think we have a challenge here to, to rethink the system. I know there are, even here uh, in, in Nice and Côte d'Azur, uh, there is this uh, local currency. I know there are a lot of uh, 
people out there, you know, just, just trying to make a little, a little tweak from it. And I think it's very interesting because we need to tap into that because we yeah. can actually learn, uh, we can learn from actually doing that, uh, being completely imperfect to, to find out, you know, the, the structure we need to, to, to make that grow. Oh, and yeah. make, the, and make so the connection toward the digital currencies. Uh, it's an interesting process. Yeah, there's a whole lot other complementary thrust that's going on at the same time, which is very encouraging. Complementary currencies, you know, local currencies. Mm -hmm. In Brazil, there are over 500 of these in different cities. Um, or Stephanie Overbeek is leading a team in Switzerland, which is putting on a conference uh, at the end of June uh, to bring together various uh, cities like Copenhagen, Ghent, uh, San Francisco, et cetera, uh, clusters to, to build on each other's shoulders because they've been operating these complementary currencies for years, if not decades, and mm -hmm. they enhance the prosperity of the local communities. Mm -hmm. so any mayor anywhere can instigate one of these and in, immediately enhance the local prosperity. Uh, but central authorities have to learn how to allow complementary currencies to blossom or encourage them to blossom. Yeah. This is happening now in, in many, many places. Mm -hmm. We just have to emulate it. And then there are people... So we, we, not, we not only have this uh, money like rain thing, which is... Eno Schmidt has pioneered this in Switzerland, the, the referendum that occurred last year, uh, which 23%, the first time Swiss people voted on this, 23%, which is a high number, actually voted in favor of unconditional basic income. Mm -hmm. So the next time it'll be a much higher number. Yeah. And Switzerland is leading the way because they are actually allowing the blockchain-based currencies to be legal tender. And that's going to influence uh, what happens by institutions, I hope, IMF, etc. Mm -hmm. so a lot of very encouraging things happening. Yeah. But keep your eye on on that conference in Switzerland, and keep your eye. Uh, oh, there are a lot of other things to keep your eye on too. Maybe we can gradually create a bibliography of, of pointers and stuff. Yeah, the, 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 I know there are there are really a lot of things going on. There are a lot of people getting their statements out there. Modern technology like this gives us the opportunity to do so in in, in abundance. Yeah. Um, the purpose of every day is uh, to, to engage with people and to to start the inquiry. Uh, what do we need to come from point A to point B? Uh, yeah. we're, go we're going to try to facilitate that uh, online as we are doing right now and offline in, in local meetups. Mm -hmm. uh, same goes for me. I'm, I am aesthetic. I am uh, very, very inspired by, your, by you, Bela. Uh, and I, I, I would like to ask to anybody to, to join this discussion and, and just give us your ideas because uh, I have learned one thing in my life. Um, Good ideas are the, are the ideas that got implemented, and bad ideas uh, are the ideas you don't tell. Mm -hmm. At least that's my vision on ideas. So the more ideas, the better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else you would like to, to share with us uh, before we uh, stop this uh, conference? Uh, anything we missed? Oh, there's masses that we missed, but I, I just <laughs> encourage everyone to join this. It's really an inquiry. I, I don't have solutions personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the inquiry needs to have two phases. One, to define that if I was in God's shoes, how would I create the world? Mm -hmm. um, without any listening to the yes part. And then once we've got that clear, then define how we get there. It was rather like what Kennedy did when we wanted to put a man on the moon. Mm -hmm. He said, first of all, okay, everyone, all the experts, please tell me why it's impossible. <laughs> mm 
and he got all the reasons why it's impossible. He said, okay, now I want the experts on, on uh, protecting the thing from the re-entry heat to tell me uh, if there are any solutions. If yeah. got solutions. But the, the first thing is to define where we can go, knowing that we can go anywhere we want. Mm -hmm. and the second thing is, okay, now we know what we want. Something which serves the earth and us. Now, uh, how do we go there? Mm -hmm. It needs all the intelligence of everyone out there uh, and engagement of everyone out there to really steer this in the right direction. And the internet enables that. And you can do it locally, when you talk in the cafes, <laughs> uh, et cetera. Okay. Okay, Thank okay you. Bella. Well, yeah, wow, it, it's very inspiring, uh, uh, Bela, th this uh, uh, mission you are on in your life. Uh, I'm, I'm in, you know that. <laughs> and uh, when I look at the Facebook uh, stream here on, on my mobile, I see uh, uh, you're doing an amazing job out there. So people are getting really ex excited about this one. And uh, uh, we're going to organize a, a local meetup uh, very, very soon based on this uh, video chat we just had All right, great. Uh, no doubt that I will invite you personally because you are in is uh, our guest of honor and uh, we'll have a we we'll have a we'll have a beautiful conversation uh, about it and try to um, try to find uh, new ways uh, to get this actually done yeah right it's exciting for me in my 80th year to be embarking on my new career <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, okay. Well, uh, you inspired us and uh, we need you, Bella. So uh, I would like to thank you for this call. I would thank like you. to thank everybody uh, who watches us online and, uh, and then we'll see the replay and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you, Wim. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye.